Okay. So slideshow. I just want to uh, mute us on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everyone uh, here in our audience and those of you that are at home watching us on Zoom. Welcome to our second in our series uh, commemorating the 175th anniversary of Black 47, which was, of course, the worst year of the Great Hunger. Um, an ironic kind of year in that actually technically there was no blight that year, but because the previous two harvests had been so bad, there was also no crops. Uh, and by now, you know, government schemes are, as Karen will, uh, Dr. Sonnenmeter will talk to us about, the government schemes are kind of slowing down, the work um, schemes, money isn't there and disease is rampant. So this is a, an absolutely terrible year. I'm. We have another two planned in October. I don't think we've um, publicized those dates yet, but I, it's going to be Professor Tyler Anminder who will speak about the upwardly mobile kind of um, famine refugees who come to New York. And then we have Dr. I believe it's Kieran Riley from Maynooth who was speaking first about evictions in Ireland during the Great Hunger. And then in the next couple of months, we'll have Dr. Kean McMahon from the University of Nevada talking about the coffin ships. I'm delighted to announce sculptor and artist Rowan Gillespie will be speaking to us. And we also have a professor, Anne. Oh, this is terrible that I forget her name. She's um, done hum tremendous work on epigenetics um, and the legacy of mental health and maybe even addiction and stuff that maybe can be tracked through the trauma, through to the trauma of the great hunger. So on Friday, we're delighted to announce we have Mar Maureen Doherty coming to us from Boston. Uh, that will not be on Zoom just live here. She's a harpist uh, who's played for, I can't tell you how many dignitaries and presidents of America and everything. And uh, she'll be here in our... Uh, Michael Flanagan Irish Heritage Music Theatre to talk to you about, uh, of course, our national symbol, which is the harp, and to play some of those best loved uh, tunes and talk to you about the history of Ireland through its music and culture. So thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Sonali, and thank you so much for coming. We're delighted to have you back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for that lovely introduction. And it's lovely to be back uh, here at the Irish Heritage Museum speaking about this. Um, so thank all of you for coming tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I realize most of you are pretty familiar with the famine, uh, but I'm going to provide a basic outline. Uh, and then I'll, we'll delve into an aspect of the famine that speaks to my broader research on poor relief and philanthropy. So. I'll be focusing a lot tonight on state poor relief, uh, how that system of poor relief developed in Ireland and why it failed so badly, right? Um, during the famine, um, we'll also be talking a lot about private relief efforts uh, that attempted to fill in and how those operated, right? Uh, so I'd like to begin by correcting a mistake that I'm going to make in speaking at times tonight, right? Uh, so whenever we talk about large institutions, the church, the government, Right, we treat them as historical actors, and they're not. Right, um, the British government did this. Right, but fundamentally, governments don't do things on their own. They're made up of people, and people direct government policy. Right, so I want to stress the people um, that I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, doesn't seem to be working. Maybe I didn't turn it on. That would help if I turned it on. There we go. <laughs> Uh, so during the famine, uh, the prime ministers of the United Kingdom uh, were part of directing that policy. So we have uh, Sir Robert Peel, uh, who was prime minister uh, in office when the famine first begins to appear. Uh, and then Lord John Russell, who takes over in 1846. And so he's the person in office for Black 47. Right. Uh, there is also their respective home secretaries. Um, in British politics, the Home Secretary is responsible for domestic affairs in the United Kingdom, which in this period, Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, so it's domestic affairs. Uh, that would be Sir James Graham for Peel and Sir George Gray for Home Secretary, uh, for John Russell, right? Uh, there's also the Lord Lieutenant um, of Ireland, but in the 19th century, that office had become much more ceremonial and so doesn't play a very important political role, right? Uh, there is, in addition, the chief secretary uh, for Ireland, who is more important in this period, and that's an, an appointed post. Uh, Peel's was Henry Pelham Clinton, 
Um, and then Russell's was Henry Lubachere, uh, and later Sir William Somerville, who does not have a portrait I could share with you. Um, so the first report of the potato blight um, was in August in 1845. About a third of that year's crop was lost, and Sir Robert Peel uh, did seem to recognize what a serious problem this was. That situation, of course, only gets worse, uh, culminating in the infamous Black 47. We can't really know how many people died in any given year. Um, but about 220,000 people emigrated and 417,000 sought relief in workhouses. Uh, things don't really improve until 1850, when not only is potato harvest largely healthy, but there had also been something of a harvest. Um, although even then, 805,000 people are being relieved in workhouses that year. The total demographic impact of the famine is huge. Um, Ireland's population in 1841 was measured by the census, a fairly recent invention at the time, uh, actually, uh, at 8,175,124 people. And 10 years later, in 1851, it was 6.5 million. Right? And it continues to fall, as you see on these charts, right? Uh, largely, it's falling because of immigration in particular, right? Emigration rates remain high consistently throughout the rest of the 19th century and really the 20th century too, frankly. By 1861, the population is about 5.7 million. By 1901, it's 4.4 million. Now there have been subsequent famines as well that contribute to that decline, right? So we don't actually have great data on precisely how many people die during the famine because of the famine directly. But we do have pretty good data on how many people were suffering because we have workhouse statistics. Uh, and the workhouse system is the primary mechanism of poor relief. Tonight, I'll focus on the system of poor relief that was in place during the famine, how that system responded to the famine and the ways in which it failed. So history is first and foremost, as I stress to all my students all the time, the study of ideas and context. So if we wanna understand policy towards poor relief in this period, we have to place those ideas within the context of that time. And central to understanding that context is understanding a general commitment to laissez-faire economics. Uh, the concept of uh, unregulated trade is not a new one in the mid-19th century. Um, Adam Smith, of course, popularizes it in the late 18th century with his famous book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Now, the core of Smith's thesis was that humans' natural tendency towards self-interest results in prosperity. Uh, Smith argued that by giving everyone freedom to produce and exchange goods as they pleased and opening the markets up to domestic and foreign competition, people's natural self-interest would promote greater prosperity than with stringent government regulations. Um, and that was the sort of prevalent ideology at the time that Smith is writing in the 18th century, right? Smith believed uh, humans ultimately promote public interest through their everyday economic choices. Um, as he put it, he generally indeed neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it by, pre by preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry. He intends only his own security. And by directing that industry in such a manner as it produced may be the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end to which was no part of his intention. So that free market force becomes known as the invisible hand. But the invisible hand needs support to bring about its magic. Specifically, it needs governments to remove mercantilist trade legislation, which depended on high tariffs and really strict protectionist economic policies. Now, interestingly, I will point out that at one point in The Wealth of Nations, uh, Smith makes a point that famine has never arisen from any other cause but the violence of government attempting by improper means to remedy the inconveniences of a dearth. So essentially, Smith here is giving an injunction against state attempts to regulate the price of grain during shortages, which was a concern in the 18th century. Right? Now, Smith, of course, dies in 1790, right? Uh, and it's very clear that he doesn't envision anything like the Irish famine occurring here. So I can't say what he would have made of it. Um, what I can say is that his book is the foundation of economic thought of British political leaders at the time, right? Uh, particularly those in the Whig government of Lord John Russell in office in Black 47, right? They would have been very familiar with Smith's injunctions about the invisible hand. <laughs> 
By the 1840s, Smith's ideas were growing in popularity, particularly among the urban middle class who were newly enfranchised thanks to the Reform Act of 1832. Most of these new voters were expected to, and many of them seemed to have voted for the Liberal Party in Britain, which was the political party that most championed free trade and the new industrial economic interests that benefited from it. Um, the Whig Party, traditionally in the 19th century, is often friendlier to Irish interests in many cases, although, as we'll see here, that doesn't go great. Um, meanwhile, the Conservative, or the Tory Party, remained the political advocates of landed wealth, and supported protectionist policies like the Corn Laws, which imposed high tariffs on imported grain. Now, because Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, uh, grain from Ireland was not subject to those tariffs. So lots of Irish grain uh, is sold in Britain where it could fetch a higher price uh, than it could in Ireland, right? Now, what is also important to point out uh, is that for many advocates of free trade in the 1840s, uh, this was more than an economic system. This was a gospel. It was the gospel of free trade. These ideas about political economy were infused with providential language. This was a highly moralized sensibility. And in part, this is because of the evangelical religious currents of thought that are really popular in the time. The belief was that free trade would spread civility, would spread peace, understanding, prosperity but also that peace and prosperity would favor those who were most morally deserving. The invisible hand of the market, that was divine providence. And that hand rewards industry and rewards those of sound moral character. It would punish sloth and sin. Poverty and bankruptcy were punishments for some deeply personal moral failure. The free market was God's divine plan. So this belief obviously works to legitimate a deeply unequal social order uh, and uneven distribution of labor. These are messianic beliefs that are surrounded free trade as an economic policy. And I think we can connect how that would influence policy during the famine. So many of these beliefs carry over into poor relief policy. And coincidentally, uh, Britain drastically revised its own poor relief policy in the 1830s. Um, and in 1838, uh, the first statutory poor law for Ireland was passed as well. Now, these are different pieces of legislation. They pass a poor law for Britain in 1834, and then a one that is specialized for Ireland in 1838. But there are similarities, and the Irish law was modeled on the English law. Uh, the English law was based on the work of a nine-man commission whose leaders included Nassau William Sr. and Sir Edwin Chadwick, um, a social reformer, and uh, Nassau William Sr. is an economist, right? So the poor law, um, the 1834 English one, and later the Irish one, is based in part on this gospel of free trade. It was also meant to centralize the administration of poor relief and to reduce the cost of looking after the poor by creating poor law unions and building a workhouse in each union. In order to receive assistance, the poor have to leave their home uh, and enter a workhouse. There's not meant to be what's called outdoor relief, right? Conditions in workhouses were intentionally harsh, deliberately so. That was on purpose. The goal is to discourage people from asking for aid. Um, upon entering a workhouse, families are split up and housed separately. They were made to wear a uniform. Uh, this illustration obviously is quite critical of the new poor law. You can probably put that together, but you can see the uniforms they're meant to do. And also some of the work they're put on, right? Um, pounding things, picking oakum, so picking apart rope, right? Things like that. Um, so families are split up and housed separately. You wear a uniform. The goal is to teach you to work, but you don't want to undercut private industry. So they put them to work at intentionally, not pointless tasks. There is a point to picking apart rope. It was used in boat building, um, but incredibly monotonous tasks that are not meant to be a threat to any prevalent private industry, right? Uh, children were hired out to work in factories or in mines. Uh, now, the idea of a workhouse had been around for some time, uh, but with this law, they're being made the state form of poor relief. Uh, and I feel I should point out that, well, workhouses were always built on the assumption that you're providing for an adult poor population who are simply too lazy to work, right? 
uh, and need to be taught how to work. Um, the statistics we have really doesn't bear that out. I've done um, significant research on this myself. This is from the Dublin workhouse, which um, of the 18th century. Um, oh, I switched slides. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, the Dublin workhouse from the 18th century. Um, and mostly it is filled with people who are either children um, or uh, superannuates would be the elderly, right? Uh, or people with a variety of different conditions um, that you can figure out, right? So regardless of the overriding belief at the time, um, you know, that people are who are in a workhouse are lazy and dependent, you know, the reality is that most people who wind up in a workhouse um, are there for a variety of reasons, right? Um, so the 1838 poor law that was enacted for Ireland is based in part on this broader context, but it was also based on concerns from the time that are very specific to Ireland. Uh, in the 19th century, um, mercantilism, the economic principle um, that was prevalent in the 18th century, argued that Ireland was underpopulated. 18th century sources about Ireland are always super concerned that Ireland is underpopulated. Um, and they continue to be really concerned about that until 1841. <laughs> uh, so they're really concerned about that. Uh, those views fell out of favor in the 19th century. Um, and the English started to view Ireland through the lens of political economy. And by that calculation, they start, they decide that Ireland is overpopulated now, and also that it is overly dependent on the potato. Now, the Irish population does grow considerably, right? Um, in 1750, it was probably a little over 3 million people. That's an estimate. We don't have census data from that time, but that's what we go with, right? Uh, the argument became that the potato was too easy to grow, that it allowed the Irish peasantry to have too many children, uh, and that this contributed to overpopulation, uh, that because it was so easy to grow, it made them too idle, it made them too rebellious. So potatoes are criticized as a lazy crop. And the Irish reliance on them are said, is said to reflect a weakness of character. So that interpretation, I mean, it's so convenient when it fits into the pre-existing stereotypes you already have. It's great when that happens, right? It fits nicely into what they already thought about the Irish. Now, of course, the reality is that Ireland isn't entirely made up of desperately poor peasants living in uh, ramshackle stone houses, surviving entirely off potatoes. It's a complex economy in the mid 19th century and people are living in a variety of different conditions. Um, right. uh, but they are eating a lot of potatoes. <laughs> that is true, right? Um, Ireland in the years before and even during the famine actually is a major exporter of cereal crops to Great Britain, right? Um, in the 1840s, uh, two million people in Britain were fed off food imported from Ireland. So Ireland is a breadbasket for the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, the potato was the staple of food for many in Ireland uh, so that you could export all these other cereal crops. Right? Potatoes aren't easily shipped, so they were grown for subsistence, not so much for sale. Uh, and in fact, the consumption of potatoes is likely what allows the scale of these exports. And you will note these exports are going on during the years of the famine as well, right? Uh, so Ireland is able to export grain because of the potato, right? Now, even sympathetic English commentators were concerned by the ubiquity of poverty in Ireland. And it is true that poverty is an issue in Ireland. Contemporary estimates place about 2 million or more in Ireland as impoverished at least part of the year. And it's an agricultural system, so that, you know, it's very cyclical, right? The census of 1841 showed that two fifths of all uh, families lived in what was classified as fourth class accommodations, a single room with little to no furniture, um, often in many cases made of sod. Right. So this is obviously a reconstruction that they put at um, University College Cork a few years ago to illustrate what these uh, conditions would have looked like. Um, and if you've ever traveled around Ireland, you would have seen the remnants of the stone cottages. Right. But that's a step up from this. Right. In 1833, a royal commission uh, was appointed to investigate the condition of the poor in Ireland. And it described the conditions that the poor lived in in cities and included reports about rural areas as well. The overwhelming view among travelers, commentators, et cetera, was that Ireland has a problem of poverty, but there was no real agreement on how to remedy that. 
And the most popular view was actually essentially Malthusian, that Ireland's population numbers are out of line with its productive capacity. So what we have leading up to the famine is a belief that Ireland is overcrowded, that it's chronically impoverished, uh, and that is what is in the minds of people who are writing that poor law in 1838. For most of its history, Ireland does not have a statutory poor law as compared to England, which passed one in 1601. Now there are structures of poor relief. There are some urban institutions that are funded by local rates uh, and then also voluntary donations. So there are houses of industry or workhouses or medical institutions uh, that rely on a combination of uh, money from property taxes, government grants, and then private donations, right? So basically the system that developed was largely private philanthropy that relies on public money in the form of parliamentary grants. But because of that, it's very piecemeal and uncoordinated. Subsistence crises placed a strain on these systems. And the most severe crisis prior uh, to this one in the mid 19th century is the famine of 1741, in which perhaps as many as 480,000 people died uh, in a country that then had less than 3 million people, right? Uh, I will note, by the way, that during that crisis, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland uh, closed the ports and banned the exports of grain. Um, in 1838, um, all of this changes with the passage of the Irish Poor Law. A royal commission had been created in 1833 uh, to investigate poverty in Ireland, headed by the Anglican Archbishop of Dublin, Richard Waitley. That commission sat for three years, and in the end, it concluded that Irish poverty was too extensive to be dealt with with the English model. So they recommended a program of public works and assisted immigration. Extensive government intervention along those lines didn't really suit the government that was in office at that time, which was a Whig government in the 1830s. So instead, they sent a guy called George Nichols, who was an English poor law commissioner to Ireland, toured the country for six weeks. Uh, and he decided to essentially extend the English poor law system to Ireland, but with some amendments. The aim of both systems is to relieve destitution while discouraging dependency on the government. Both laws make a distinction between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. Both are based on the principle of less eligibility, that any relief provided has to be less attractive than what was um, available if you don't enter a workhouse. Right? This is achieved, of course, through the conditions in the workhouses I described. There are, however, a few important distinctions for Ireland. First, in Ireland, relief could only be administered through the workhouse. There is no possibility whatsoever of outdoor relief in any circumstance, right? Uh, two is there is no right to relief. When workhouses become full, there was no obligation to provide aid in other forms. Uh, and finally, there was no law of settlement. So the Irish people could not acquire a right to relief in a different district than where you were born. So internal migration is going to work against you. Right. Um, overall, the law is stricter than its English counterpart. It reflects an intense aversion to the concept of outdoor relief in Ireland. There are strict qualifications for any relief. And this was deemed necessary because it was felt that if the system was as liberal um, as the English system, that it would become overwhelmed. So they institute the system, the workhouses were constructed uh, very quickly, and the new poor law is in place by 1845. Uh, so they divide it up into unions. It really does not align with traditional county boundaries, as I'm sure many of you will note and be familiar with. And then there's uh, one workhouse in each poor law union. The black dots already have it built prior to 1849, right? And then but because this has only been student in 1838, it takes a while to build a building like that, right? So we divide Ireland into 130 poor law unions. Each poor law union had a board of guardians, had its own workhouse, is financed by local property taxes. Um, the building of workhouses began almost immediately. And within a few years, there was enough space in Irish workhouses for about 100,000 people. By 1845, about 118 of these workhouses are in operation. Uh, and this is uh, an example of one and what they would have looked like, right? To qualify for relief, applicants had to be destitute. They submitted to an interview with the guardians. If they qualified, they and their family were bathed, 
clothes and workhouse uniforms, segregated by gender and age, uh, and of course have to reside within the building. Now the purpose of the workhouse is to discourage you from doing just that, right? And it seems to have worked because the workhouses prior to 1845 were basically empty, right? Um, the Dunfani workhouse in County Donegal um, had five inmates prior to the famine. Um, and what inmates they have are mostly um, the elderly, <laughs> the infirm, or orphaned children, children without guardians, right? The influx of able-bodied adult paupers simply does not materialize. Uh, because the Irish poor law does not allow relief outside the workhouse, it was limited in its capacity um, because it can only relieve the destitute. Um, any smallholder, anyone with a small amount of land in temporary need cannot receive assistance from the poor law. And finally, because it's locally financed through local property taxes, the burden is going to fall heavily on districts that are also most seriously economically uh, affected by the distress, right? So 1847, 417,000 people seek relief in workhouses. Workhouse overcrowding is a significant issue, right? Um, and in 1846, 1847, about 2,500 people on average died a week in workhouses. Uh, I think last year I gave a talk on disease in the Irish famine, and uh, these are exactly the kind of conditions that lead to outbreaks of things like typhus. Um, so there is a flaw in the design of the 1838 poor law to begin with, um, but um, these flaws might have been more easily hidden, but for events, a mysterious disease that begins uh, to affect the potato crop first in America, uh, and then by 1845, uh, in the rest of Europe. It appears in England, in Scotland, in Belgium, in Holland, and by that fall in Ireland as well. Um, at the time, what exactly was happening was unknown. Uh, Robert Peel is the prime minister. He puts together a scientific commission to determine if there's a cure, but they don't, they can't identify the cause um, or find one at that time. They theorize that it had something to do with wet conditions, um, but they're unable to offer any kind of useful suggestions. Uh, and the actual cause isn't identified until 1890, right? Um, so they actually don't identify this till 1890, and they're, therefore they're not actually providing much in the way of assistance, right? The potato crop of 1845 was 33% less than usual. In 1846, it was 75% less than normal. In 1847, there simply weren't enough acres under cultivation, all right? There were only 284,000 acres under cultivation down from 2 million, right? So that's why we have famine in that year, right? Uh, starvations begin in 1846, but most of the dead fall victim to diseases, typhus, dysentery, scurvy. There's actually a cholera outbreak, which was an unfortunate coincidence. Um, the lack of land under cultivation contributes to the continuation of the famine. Blight strikes again in 1848 and 1849, um, and the quantity of potatoes remains far below 1845 levels. And these conditions don't abate until about 1852. Uh, in the intervening years, mortality more than triples um, as people die of starvation and this array of diseases, and you're likely familiar uh, with these illustrations from the Illustrated London News from 1847, which show conditions in the West of Ireland, right? Um, yes, as well, right? Meanwhile, in London, uh, the seat of government for the United Kingdom, the response becomes a political issue. 1846, Peel chose to respond to the crisis by ordering the importation of food from America. Uh, but he runs into an issue with his political party. Um, at that time, the protectionist trade laws called the Corn Laws were in place. Uh, and the idea of those was to protect domestic production by banning the importation of food, right? So they install very high tariffs and they fix grain prices to favor domestic farmers, right? Um, so essentially the law made it impossible uh, for the poor to buy cheap food that had been imported from abroad. Peel, after much deliberation, sought to repeal the Corn Laws um, a decision which was intensely controversial in England and within his own party, 
uh, which tended to represent traditional landed interests. Uh, he was accused in Parliament of exaggerating the extent of the Irish situation uh, in order to advance a political goal. In the end, he does manage to repeal the Corn Laws, um, but it cost him his position and his government falls apart and he's removed as prime minister as a result of that to be replaced by Lord John Russell of the Whig Party. So the Irish famine makes a huge contribution uh, to the triumph of the gospel of free trade in England because repealing the Corn Laws is seen as a triumph of the gospel of free trade. Of course, the repeal of these laws only has so much of an effect in Ireland in the short term um, because any imported grain still had to be bought um, by people who really didn't have the funds to buy it. Um, and in the long term, Ireland sort of loses a protected position as the breadbasket of the rest of the UK. So this imported corn was meant to be sold cheaply, but still at market value, by the way, they're not giving it away. Right. Um, and it was intended to ease the situation in Ireland in the early months of the crisis. It reflects an idea that they think this is a very much a temporary thing. Right. Uh, the potato crops failure led to food shortages. What food there is is prohibitively expensive. If you're a large landowner, you're still going to make more money exporting food to England. So they all still do that. Right. Importing corn causes its own problems. Uh, for one thing, people were unfamiliar with corn meal. They didn't really know how to prepare it. They couldn't afford the flour or oatmeal that you're supposed to mix with it to make it more digestible. Uh, there's lots of reports of people having stomach problems from this sudden new food source that they're not used to, right? Peel organized a relief commission to sell the food at cost and set up a public work scheme, the wages of which were meant to be sufficient to buy the imported corn. But, and you've probably put this together, if you're busy at the public work scheme, you're not planting potatoes in 1847. Uh, so these temporary relief measures were not handled through the poor law administration because they did recognize that the poor law simply wasn't equipped to this extraordinary level of distress. Now, it's worth pointing out uh, that despite potato shortages, Irish landowners are still exporting grain. Uh, the grain crop is not damaged and landowners who cultivated grain continued selling it in English markets uh, where it gets more money. Right. Because Ireland's part of the United Kingdom, it's not subject to the Corn Laws, and so they're able to keep doing that. Both Peel and later Russell's government chose not to interfere with this trade, uh, despite many calls at the time to ban exports of food from Ireland during the famine. Um, Irish grain continues to be sold abroad in lower numbers, as you saw from the chart before, but it is still happening. Now, most in Ireland regarded Peel's measures as relatively effective. Uh, the Irish newspaper, the Freeman's Journal, praised Robert Peel that, quote, no man died of famine during his administration, which is almost certainly not strictly true. Um, but you do get the idea that they feel he has made an attempt. Right. The effectiveness of his measures is really difficult to intervene, to determine. Right. Um, and his measures are really quite limited. Right. Um, his government rebuked the suggestion um, that any of this should be carried out through the existing poor law structure or that the poor law should be expanded or changed in any significant way. Um, Home Secretary James Graham argued that, quote, the claim of the able-bodied for relief from the poor rate, when once admitted in Ireland, the locust will devour the land and the concession once made can never be withdrawn. So the Whig government, when that comes to power, believes the government should interfere in trade as little as possible. Uh, and so it actually stops the policy of food imports, leaving that up to local merchants. Right. Uh, but they do concentrate on public work schemes. And so that policy continues. They do dictate that the cost of these schemes has to be carried out through local property taxes, however. So Ireland is paying for its own relief. Right. Pay on the public works uh, was low. Um, and often not enough actually to support a family or buy food given the cost of food at the time. Food was imported by private enterprise. It was sold at food depots, but again, not below market price. Now food prices globally are rising because the famine is an international event. Potato crops are failing everywhere and potatoes were a staple food for the lower class everywhere, right? Many European governments responded to this crisis in their own countries by intervening in the marketplace, by purchasing food for distribution, 
Uh, but that's not something the Russell administration would ever consider. And it's not something the Peel administration does either. Right? In addition, the public works have other unintended consequences because it keeps farmers away from their fields. And so that's why we see this precipitous drop in the amount of land under cultivation. Right? The response was to focus through the poor law unions uh, and to be fair, the impact of the famine is uneven across Ireland. Um, but the problem was the insistence on local relief being financed locally means that if one region is doing fine, um, they are not providing assistance to a region that is destitute, right? So we have an enormous burden on regions whose economy is most devastated. So it's clear that there were problems in the famines in the system of famine relief. But what a lot of historians disagree on is if these are ideological or if these are institutional. We have the political and economic philosophers of the era that certainly make Britain and its government reluctant uh, to engage in large scale relief. Um, but given the scale of the crisis, is it even possible to provide effective relief? The insistence on making relief a local responsibility almost certainly hampered effectiveness. It almost certainly leads to an increase in mortality, evictions, and emigration. The regions most affected were the poorest even before the famine. But there are plenty of historians who have argued that the scale of the crisis is so vast that it's unlikely there would have been an effective government response, right? Um, the historians L.M. Cullen and T.C. Smout have said that, quote, the Irish problem was too huge for the British state to overcome. And it certainly is a huge problem. Um, Charles Trevelyan, I expect most of you have heard of him, the assistant secretary of the Treasury who oversaw famine relief efforts for the Russell government, was certainly devoted to the laissez-faire economic policies of the period. And in private correspondence, he noted that, quote, it forms no part of the functions of government to provide supplies of food. It falls to the share of government to protect the merchant and agriculturist in the free exercise of their respective employments. Trevelyan um, and the rest of the Whig administration tended to blame landlords in Ireland for the condition of the Irish peasantry um, and thought that famine relief really ought to be the responsibility of the landlord class. Uh, numerous popular articles in histories, um, including those by uh, Cecil Woodham Smith and Tim Pat Coogan, have quoted Trevelyan as saying, quote, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. The real evil with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people. However, by the way, I, you know, look, there's a lot of things I can say about Charles Trevelyan. He never actually says that. <laughs> so I got to put that in, right? Just, I need to be historically accurate. It's deeply important to me, right? Um, that is, seems to be a result of a misinterpretation um, of an article written in 1960 uh, called Sir Charles Trevelyan at the Treasury. Um, he never actually says that. No, he says what he said above about he doesn't think government should do anything, um, but he doesn't say uh, the judgment of God sent the calamity. Right. Um, and most of his contemptuous words are for Irish landlords. Uh, and that's where he focuses a lot. Right. Um, his, he does have some empathy for Irish peasantry, but it tank, tends to take on a very paternalistic tone. Right. In 1846, um, he wrote of the famine and relief efforts, quote, the greatest improvement of all which could take place in Ireland would be to teach the people to depend upon themselves for developing the resources of their country. Um, there's plenty of historical disagreement um, over his exact role and his exact responsibility in famine relief policy. He's one part of a broader administration. The historian Joel Mulkier has argued that the root of the lack of action during the worst years of the famine uh, was that even at, while it's still part of the United Kingdom, Ireland was considered an alien and hostile country. Mulkier contends that this attitude explains the lack of investment in Ireland before the famine, the comparatively harsher views of Irish poverty, and the lack of resources put towards the famine relief, right? He argues that if a similar crisis had occurred in England or in Wales, the government would have provided aid at a much larger scale, regardless of laissez-faire economics. But instead, during the years of the famine, the Treasury spends about 9.5 million pounds on famine relief, 
which represented 0.5% of the GDP. For Irish smallholders unable to support themselves through the public works, the only option for them is the workhouse. And by 1847, uh, workhouses are filled to capacity despite everything about them, right? Um, to receive Irish family, to re uh, receive relief, Irish families have to consent to this confinement. And as workhouses become filled to overcapacity, that just allows disease to spread more, right? Um, Now, as the crisis worsened, uh, the government passes the Destitute Poor Act in 1847. This disbands the public work schemes and does provide some provision for outdoor relief, or essentially soup kitchens are set up out of poor law unions, which is what this is showing, right? Seeking relief at the gate of the workhouse, not, not seeking entry. The rations at soup kitchens were low and disease um, ravaged people simply didn't seem to receive enough nourishment from these soup rations, right? Um, there were of course still plenty of restrictions on outdoor relief as well. Um, and generally only the incredibly destitute receive outdoor relief, right? Um, by the time of the harvest of 1847, the government believed the crisis to be ending, and that, of course, was incorrect. But because of that, they scaled back relief efforts. The Irish Poor Law Extension Act of 1847 stated that poor law unions were to take control of the relief efforts and that they needed to derive all of their money from local funds. So the guiding principle is that Irish property must pay for Irish poverty. So the cost is shifted from the British Treasury uh, to Irish landlords and tenants. Uh, and of course, that's because many in Britain conveniently placed the woes for all of this on Irish landlords, on the Irish land system. Um, Irish landlords were held to be neglectful of their duties, oppressive, predatory. Um, that's rhetoric that is certainly heard in Ireland at this time, but you also hear a lot of it in England at this time. It's very convenient to blame only them, right? There's a fixation on the delinquencies of Irish landlords um, that blinded people to how these laws are actually going to operate. Um, because this act does allow for outdoor relief, although only under certain conditions, if a workhouse is full, if the applicant is older in form. The law also allowed commissioners to alter the size of unions and to increase the number of workhouses. And it contained a provision called the Gregory Clause, named for an MP from Dublin, William Gregory, who suggested it, which stated that anyone who owned more than a quarter of an acre of land was not eligible for relief. Um, the clause was interpreted to refuse relief to many, and landlords wind up using it as an excuse to evict thousands of cottiers, so smallholders, right? Um, because smallholders would try to surrender all but a quarter of an acre so that they would be eligible for relief, but landowners simply wouldn't allow it. So they make them surrender everything, right? There was another clause from an earlier law, 1843, called the Four Pounds Clause, which made landlords responsible for all taxes on holdings valued under four pounds. So between that and the Gregory Clause, Irish landlords are, have significant financial motivation to rid themselves of smallholders, right? Um, so evictions, uh, which you'll hear more about in a couple of weeks, right? Um, so this is used to justify those. Uh, landlords are liable to pay the poor rates on small holdings, right? Uh, and that of course leads to clearing of estates um, as a way to avoid paying those rates. So from this, we have estimates of about 500,000 people being evicted during the famine uh, from small farms. Anything under five acres is what we classify as a fall, small fa farm. And those small farms virtually disappear, actually. Uh, in turn, evictions place additional burdens on the poor rates as evicted families either had to secure new lodgings uh, so they could receive outdoor relief or they face going into the workhouse um, there's not great options here, right? Um, there were many economists and members of government at the time who felt that these evictions uh, would allow for the consolidation of property and hopefully larger, more economically viable farms. And that was seen as a long-term goal for Ireland, right? Uh, there's an 1849 op-ed in the London Times that quotes, that notes the uh, 
a hideous chasm prepared for future prosperity. Uh, so Irish smallholders and laborers have, uh, have reason to fear eviction uh, for years while large farmers had long-term fixed leases uh, of sometimes decades or more, right? That situation could change drastically. Um, dispossessed tenants were directed to overcrowded and overburdened workhouses, or of course, as you're likely aware, directed to emigrate, right? Now, during all of this, this doesn't take place in a vacuum, in Ireland and around the world, private charity steps in as best it really can. Uh, the preference of the Whig government was to rely on private charity to provide social services because they really don't think it's the role of the government to provide anything, right? The famine does provoke an international response. Uh, the Society of Friends, the Quakers, raised money in America and in Britain and distributed it in local areas. The British Relief Association raised money from some of the most prominent individuals in the world, including Queen Victoria, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, anyone they could get to donate some money, something. Uh, the political considerations that affected state poor relief didn't apply to private philanthropy and private organizations at times acted at the request of the British government. In 1849, Trevelyan wrote to the uh, the head of the Central Relief Committee of the Society of Friends um, to inquire on behalf of Prime Minister John Russell what their future plans were and to offer a personal donation of 100 pounds. Uh, I would like to note, however, in their reply, the Relief Committee said, quote, that the difficulty was so far beyond the reach of private exertion that the only machinery which was practical to employ was that under the control of public authorities, right? Um, so they believe that the, quote, the government alone can raise the funds, carry out the measures necessary in many districts to save the lives of people. So there are practical difficulties with relying on private philanthropy to carry out relief of this scale. Uh, but nonetheless, people around the world gave money for the relief of the suffering Irish. It was a cause celebre of the day, right? Uh, private philanthropy was spotty and imperfect, and enthusiasm for donating to the cause ran out before assistance did right, for the need for assistance did. Uh, but it does play an important role um, in propping up the weaknesses of state poor relief systems. Low wages on the public works combined with high food prices um, reduced the effectiveness of that response. And so organizations uh, like the Irish Relief Association that were set up to sell food below market prices or to give food away are important. When the state transitioned from the public works to the poor law, there was a gap of several months in which private soup kitchen, kitchens played an incredibly important role in distributing relief. Right now, oh, sorry, this is a emigrated village. Here we go, soup kitchens. Uh, and one of the soup recipes, there are several that are tried, but this one became quite a, a cause. Uh, I've tried to make it, it's very watery, but it's not, it's not bad, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not, it's not great. Yeah, it, 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 it's cheap, which is, of course, the design of it to be cheap to make, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you just have to scale it down to make it in a pot in your, in your home. Um, so private charity props up these relief efforts um, and, of course, supports people um, who otherwise might not have been eligible for relief through the workhouse system. Um, however, there are downsides. Uh, Philanthropy in a literal sense is the use of private money to promote the welfare of others. Uh, in practice, donors desire, decide what they think that welfare should consist of. And I point this out uh, to illustrate perhaps the most famously uh, maligned example of private philanthropy in the famine, superism, uh, which I always get asked about, so I'm just including it in the talk now, it's just in here, okay? Uh, superism refers to the relief efforts um, by uh, some Protestant evangelical societies like this one, uh, Reverend Edward Nangle, um, in which they offered relief in exchange for religious instruction, Protestant religious instruction, right? So religious conversion, right? Um, it's not actually that common, but it did exist. It does take place. It, it was quite talked about at the time that Nangle was doing that, right? Um, he does this out of his mission colony in County Mayo. Uh, which seems to have provided only assistance to children who attended at school, right? And that's the only way you could get assistance from him. Um, his policy was widely condemned at the time, um, although he, of course, absolutely thinks he's doing the right thing. To his mind, he is saving their souls, 
as well as their bodies, right? Um, and in a way, superism actually plays a much more important role in the popular memory of the famine. Um, and it unfortunately overshadows a lot of the much more impartial philanthropy um, that was offered at great personal cost by people, right? Many of these Quakers end up risking their lives as do many other philanthropists. Uh, this is Reverend Robert Trail, who was a Protestant clergyman in County Cork. Um, he set up a soup kitchen out of his own home with his own money that he operated um, for the benefit of all um, until his death in 1847 from typhus fever, a disease that he definitely contracted because of his contact with impoverished famine victims. Right. Um, but with all of these major charitable organizations, they largely cease operation in 1847 or in 1848, and the famine continues for several years after that, right? There are still small private charities in operation, uh, but the understanding was the poor law was going to take over. Um, and there's little understanding of the economic unviability of relying on the poor law as it was structured. In 1849, the Russell administration made a grant of 50,000 pounds to the poorest unions and the poor law, but made clear that there would be no more public money forthcoming. Most of the government money that came from the Russell administration came in the form of loans, which had to be paid back via, again, the property taxes. Right? Also in 1849, they passed the rate in aid tax, which classified that only Irish money can pay for Irish poor relief. Right. Um, but it does allow funds to be shifted between poor law unions, so it fixes that bit at least, right? Um, although less burdened poor law unions uh, objected to that a lot. They did not want their money leaving to, to help others, right? Um, meanwhile, Edward uh, Twistleton, the chief poor law commissioner, objected to that act, saying it was the duty of the empire to assist its afflicted partner. And he resigned his position, vocally criticizing the relief policies being pursued in Ireland, saying, quote, I wish to leave distinctly on record that from want of sufficient food, many persons in these unions are at present dying or wasting away. And at the same time, it is quite possible for this country to prevent the occurrence there of any death from starvation by the advance of a few hundred pounds. The blight itself doesn't fully disappear until 1852, uh, and by which point we have a 25% population drop. So the story of poor relief is not one that I think anyone can classify as a success. It's impossible to know for sure how many would have died without different relief efforts if things had changed slightly. We can only speculate about that. Um, but most historians would conclude that more could have been done. And I note this because in 1801, Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. Um, it was one part of a wealthy and thriving nation state that is at the center of a vast and powerful empire. The resources of the British Empire in this period were extensive, and that includes its financial resources. The Parliament of the United Kingdom paid 20 million pounds in the 1830s to compensate slaveholders in uh, the Caribbean for the loss of their human property. Um, in 1853 to 1856, they found 76 million pounds to spend on the Crimean War, which worked out great. And now we never fight about it again. Um, they spent about nine and a half million pounds on Irish famine relief. So that's the sort of broader context here. The issue is not a lack of resources. Uh, the resources of the empire exist. They are simply not available uh, for poor relief and they're not available for Ireland. Uh, so. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for your time, and I open to any questions. Anyone have questions or comments? Yeah, Jennifer. Um, so I believe that there was also um, a problem with the potato in Scotland. There is, yes. Is there any uh, comparison studies about British um, uh, relief efforts in Scotland versus Ireland? So, yes. Um, there is a... the the. Uh, so the failure of the potato crop affects Scotland as well, particularly the highland areas of Scotland. Um, and it, there is a famine. There are famine conditions there, right? Again, particularly the fam the, in the highland areas of Scotland. Um, and there has been work that compares these two, uh, understandably, of course, right? 
Um, and generally what's pointed out is that there's a lot of similarities, right? So the famine in Scotland mostly affects the Highland population who are also known for being rebellious, who are also known for their Catholic religion, for their Celtic cultural differences. So there's a lot of comparisons to be made. Yeah, um, it is not uh, massively better <laughs> in Scotland. Although the Highlands of Scotland do have the Lowlands of Scotland that provide some assistance. Um, and the Lowlands of Scotland were quite prosperous at that point. Yeah. Yes. Would you be able to put your pie chart back up? Oh, sure. Oh, that's hard. Uh, one, I'm scrolling back to that. One person on YouTube said a point of confusion for me when I was first reading about this was the overuse of the term corn, which in Ireland referred to the oats and other grain rather than what we call corn in the US. Yeah, that, uh, so th I do always have to clarify that for students that yes, um, they're using the term corn in this period to refer to pretty much any like cereal grain. And so even the corn laws is not referring to corn that we know, right? It refers to a, any kind of cereal crop. Um, and then, but the, what they're importing under Peel's government is actually cornmeal as we know it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but yes. So like, I guess my question is, why is the background for other categories? Mm -hmm. I would I would be happy to. Yeah. Um, so uh, I took this directly from the source without like am amending it a bit. And a lot of these we would probably classify together. Uh, sound children are healthy children under the ages of I think the cutoff was about 12. OK, um, super annuates doesn't seem to be used for anyone under the age of 60, although there's, you know, so we've got that. Infirm is the broadest one, and that could be a lot of different things, frankly, and it's almost, almost certainly a variety of conditions that are going in there. Uh, Bedrid um, is a more severe category of infirm, right? So entirely confined to bed. Uh, the King's Evil uh, scr yeah, I love that one too. Scrofula is a, a disease of the period that, as it turns out, touching kings does not cure you of, despite, uh, and they stopped trying that by this period, actually. But they did used to do that in like the Middle Ages. They would try and have a monarch touch you to cure you of that. Um, but so scrofula was a condition. Um, a lot of these are going to be really broad. Um, so fools almost certainly would refer to people who we would classify as. Um, um, what would be the popular term today? Um, mentally, yes, let's go with that. Cognitive deficiency would be, I think, the way to think of that. Um, mad, broadly speaking, it's probably people with schizophrenia or something like that, like a variety of mental illness that they cannot conceal, right? Um, fits. Um, well, that could be lots of things, right? Um, so it could just be that you have a seizure disorder, um, but also it could be, you know, something like MS, right? Yeah. Which would cause that. Any, like any, they sometimes call it falling sickness, right? So anything where you can't quite control your movements, right? Uh, lame is paralyzed, blind we know, dumb is mute. Um, the ones that are kind of tricky to get at would be infirm and what they really mean by that. Um, could be a lot of different things. Yeah. Another question on YouTube. When you talk about this history, do you find it difficult to use the word famine? I ask because I'm aware of how often it generates passionate objection in favor of words like genocide. So I just replied, in Ireland, we tend to use the phrase hunger, mm -hmm. but that phrase is not really recognized here. And you can speak to, if you like, the intent, like some historians say there was no murderous intent. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you're they're, they are touching on a debate even about what we call this, right? And it's often called the Great Hunger. I tend to go with calling it the famine because I feel like it's more recognizable to American audiences. When I did a book on this, we called it the famine because we felt like, okay, people will know what that means. Mm -hmm. We move away from calling it the potato famine these days because, as I hope I made clear, uh, there's a lot more going on here than just a crop failing, right? Like crops failed lots of places. There's only you know, people starving here. So there's more going on. Um, and generally, I would have to look up the precise definition of genocide. But my understanding is that genocides require, for one thing, like government intent. Yeah, intent and generational. Yes. 
and uh, it is difficult for me to argue that there's uh intent uh i think there's a lot of incompetence <laughs> yeah. um i just want to make sure there's no question yeah oh yes i don't know how to do that um yeah so you know i'd like you to extend if you don't mind on the the landlord thing um mm -hmm. when i did my talk last week the week before about the stole for instance so we're one of those one of the unions we had terrible problems in our records of the landlords being absentee yes and so refusing even though they were levied taxes you know 400 pounds or whatever one guy like not actually lord of soul but one of the other ones was threatened you know with like i'll put i'll publish this in the paper and he writes back the agent was like do it i don't care yeah he's <laughs> so, never there yeah. so how can you get money from these landlords who are in england and, and paying their taxes in england but not for their irish land Yes. So the problem of absentee landlordism is an issue we can date back to like 200 years before the famine, right? This is a significant issue that it's talked about throughout the 18th century and well through this period as well. Throughout the 19th century, really not until independence did yeah. they stop. Uh, actually, until the, the land reforms of the late 19th century does this cease, cease being talked about. So the problem of absenteeism is that large landowners generally sought to live in England. Um, in many cases, it might be because they also have English property and English titles, um, and they found England to be more comfortable, um, and they found England to be closer to the centers of power. And in particular, this becomes even more of a problem after the Act of Union, because they are literally correct about that after 1801. It is the center of power to be in London. Uh, prior to that, there was, you know, sort of this thriving parliament in Dublin, particularly in the late 18th century. And so there's some motivation to stay in Ireland and be in Dublin and be close to Irish political power. But after 1801, there is no motivation if you want to become politically powerful to stay in Ireland. Uh, and so actually, if you're an Irish MP, you have to go to London for a significant portion of the year. Um, and many large landowners uh, choose to live in England permanently uh, on um, English estates, many of whom have English estates. They have, you know, an English title in addition to their Irish title, mm -hmm. right? Um, but their lifestyle in, uh, in England is funded by the profits of their property in Ireland. So that means that wealth is being exported from Ireland every year in massive amounts. And this is talked about throughout the 18th and 19th century, that Ireland is just constantly losing money because all the largest, wealthiest people don't live there, and so they don't spend their money there. So absenteeism contributes to this. And then I think we can also think about what that means if you're distant from these people, what, you're not going to care what happens to them. And they, there's certainly very little evidence that they did care that much what happened to their tenants, right? Their tenants are an idea to them, not a person. Uh, and so you intend, instead relied on land agents uh, to collect rents from them, but you know that is someone who's working for wages, of course, um, and in very different situations. Um, but because you're not there, you also face no social approbation if you don't follow the traditional noblesse oblige that people believed in at that time, right? The obligation of nobility to provide assistance to their peasantry, to their tenants. Um, People like English large landholders talk a lot about that and how you know important that is to them socially. But if your land is in Ireland and you're never there, you're actually not performing noblesse oblige, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm sketchy about that, frankly, anyway, <laughs> as, as we're relying on that uh, in this situation. But also, if they're not there, they're not, they have, would feel no obligation to perform it. Yeah. Um, I can't help but think when you spoke about the absentee landlord, he feels very different in the cities today. We have absentee landlords. I mean, they're not responsible, you know, to take care of people, but yeah. people pay rent when there's responsibility to take to respond to certain kinds of services, and they don't. Right, you're not paying your property taxes. They live in the suburbs, and they live, I mean, people who grew up in Oleg, and they move out, and then they rent a house, or, and they don't have to live um, in the city, or people who live down the mm -hmm. or someplace else. And um, it's very similar, isn't it? Yeah. And they yeah. don't, and they, they, you know, we talk in the city about cold violence, or like, but they, they don't live here. Who cares? Yeah. 
but it's very interesting yeah. like the even the language around business and mm -hmm. you know deserving poor and mm -hmm. free market economy. Yeah. Like, a lot of those phrases are things we hear in America today, you know, because of the capitalist, of course, in Ireland too. But yep. you know, it, it's interesting to hear the how that can sound like a virtue, you know, in, in certain conditions, and yet it was the very thing that was kind of detrimental, you know, at home. So it is, yeah, yeah. cycles, I think. I know, good. right? I like the, this language we still use, yeah. sometimes in different scenarios and contexts, but functionally, we would still use it in the same way to describe certain classes of people we view as deserving of public assistance and those we don't, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and then I think you're right to pointing to this broad issue, right? That if you're not in a community, then you're not supporting that community. And uh, certainly plenty of arguments could be made that the current housing crisis in Ireland is exacerbated by, I don't know, massive corporations owning all yeah. the property and renting it as Airbnbs. <laughs> yeah. or um, And of course, because they're not there. So yeah. what do they care? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And even like the tax thing, you know, yeah. we kind of flout our own tax rules as part of the EU because, you know, they, they have an office with nobody in it and they're not paying taxes, you know. Right, yeah. But yet the workers are using the system, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think we're done with questions online. Uh, nobody here. No, and no one. Okay, thanks guys on Zoom there. And um, I'd say we're back in person on Friday with Maureen Doherty from Boston, The Harvest. And then next week, don't really even remember um I, I god i don't know what's on next week it's on the facebook page yeah it's on the facebook page oh i know on the 28th we have john joe mcginley from ireland she's going to give a talk about the irish wise guys uh it's fantastic actually about how you know like the gangs of new york and morrissey and all these things sprung up during the nativist era and then gradually got overtaken by the italian mafia uh but you know we'll talk about crime and all that stuff so thanks very much for tuning in, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Son and Lisa. We thank really you. appreciate having you back. I'm looking forward to this series continuing. I think it's very important to, you know, talk about these issues. Um, obviously, some of the, we just, our last few questions there show that those issues are still uh, happening, you know, today. So it's important to um, to learn from the past.